Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome from the Moravian Archives. I'm glad we have so many people attending today's lecture. My name is Paul Poiker, and I'm archivist at the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Our speaker today is Alice Smith Duncan, and she will speak on the 19th century artist Rufus Grider. Alice Smith Duncan holds a BA in English Literature and History from Colby College and an MA in History Museum Studies from the State University at Anianta. In 2011, she curated the exhibition Drawn to the Same Place, Rufus Grider and Fritz Vogt, 1890-1900, at the Arkell Museum in Kanajahari, New York. She's also the author of Sir Francis Drake and the Struggle for an Ocean Empire. Earlier this year, Alice was awarded with a Vernon Nelson research grant from the Moravian Archives to do additional research on Rufus Grider. And that's why Alice is here at the Moravian Archives and she will be presenting from Bethlehem. Grider was a Moravian from Lidditz who lived many years in Bethlehem during which time he made numerous drawings of historical buildings and sites in the area. In the 1880s, Grider suddenly moved away from Bethlehem to Kanajahari. Later, the Moravian church purchased many of his Moravian related drawings shortly after the 105th anniversary of Bethlehem in 1892. And these drawings are now part of the holdings of the Moravian archives. If you have questions for our speaker, feel free to put them in the chat. After the lecture, uh, the speaker is happy to take those questions. This lecture is going to be recorded. And in order to protect your privacy, everybody's video is turned off. Please make sure you stay muted. And now I would like to hand it over to our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Alice Smith Duncan. Paul, thank you very much. Um, and I do thank Dr. Paul Poiker and Tom McCullough and Kelly, all of the Moravian archives here. Um, you will be seeing as I speak now, a loop of random images that will give you some idea of the range of work that Grider did over his long life. Paul had um, asked me to concentrate on his New York work. Um, however, a lot of people I know don't know about his Pennsylvania life. So I'm gonna to try to hit it all and uh, see how we go. I'm starting off by reading a thesis of um, just a preface of a thesis that um, I put together a few years ago and I'll just read it. I apologize um, for, oh, these slides are funny. Okay, <laughs> um, any, any uh, misstatements I, I will read badly. Okay, the motivating goal of this project has been to find out why and how Rufus Alexander Grider, born 1817 in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, died 1900 in Kanajahari, New York, how he came to be who he was. It began with an exploration of a prodigious and irreplaceable body of work Grider left behind in New York State, currently in Kanajahari and at the New York State Library Archives and Special Collections. There is a prodigious and irreplaceable body of work left behind uh, documenting the greater Mohawk Valley region. His work more and more frequently uh, sustains and illustrates the work of central New York historians. It more and more vividly captures the imagination of visitors to the region, to the region's museums, to researchers of genealogy, 
and more and more frequently commands jaw-dropping prices at auction. But my work has turned out to be in good part about his religion, about his life and work in Pennsylvania, and also, of course, about the people he knew and the six decades of 19th century American life he experienced before coming to New York. He was 65. He lived in New York for 17 more years. It gives me hope <laughs> that I have work ahead of me. I am by no means a scholar, and I'm certainly not qualified in any way to assess with any true authority Grider's merits as either an artist or as an historian himself. Someone with those qualifications could do very much better by his accomplishments. Some have already begun to examine these angles uh, simultaneous with my general research, and I hope they continue to do so. But as it happens, I found him when no one better was, no one better equipped was looking. Uh, at the time, I was a 50-year-old displaced faculty wife, new to central New York, who'd gone back to school in a new and unfamiliar part of the country. Through true serendipity, my own first casual introduction to speculating about Rufus Grider happened to coincide with my first graduate course in American folk art. Thank you, Dr. Paul D'Ambrosio of the Fenimore Museums. In the course of that course, I heard for the first time about fraktur work, decorated texts made by the Pennsylvania Dutch and that fracture was most often executed by school teachers. Well, Rufus Grider, I'd heard, and I always remembered his name. My brother's name is Rufus, so it, that sank in. But Grider had taught art a century before, after coming to Canada Harry from Pennsylvania, leaving many illustrated writings. I heard about this, but it was kind of vague. These writings about local historic sites, this is why he is remembered. Oh, how interesting, I thought vaguely. Perhaps he was a displaced fracture artist. When pressed to select a thesis topic, not long after, I decided to find out. I was close to dead wrong about the Fraktur connection, but I was dead right about Grider being interesting. In fact, I think quite remarkably fascinating. I approached to first his story from the local angle. He'd lived and worked in Canada Harry, this small but historically rich old town in the Mohawk Valley on the banks of that river and on the banks of the Erie Canal. So with great ease, because many historically minded people had and have long admired and appreciated his work and his personality, I easily learned that he'd been a virtually ubiquitous presence, presence on the local cultural scene for some 17 years of the late 19th century, his last 17 years. And he was prodigiously productive during that time. But that's about as far as it went. Existing research and interesting writer to date, which is far from exhausted, has focused on his work, um, which exists in such overwhelming volume in New York alone. There are well over 3,000 recorded images mostly extensive annotated in his own hand by Grider himself, that covers such a broad range of historic and natural material that no one had trouble to look terribly hard at the man himself. The material he covered, by the way, includes uh, American colonial history, military history, architectural and religious history, 
flora and fauna, Native American history and religion, personal history, music history, and education. You're busy there. So that's where this started. I began wondering about him as I came across informal appreciations, some occasional quoted passages of his own notes on what he and his ambitions had been like. Biographical sketches turned out to be available online in libraries or from small past uh, exhibitions. There were several shows in the Montgomery County, Mohawk Valley uh, area in 1984 and 1991. These narratives generally and uniformly repeated provocative skeletal facts of his life, which I now realize were derived from two detailed obituaries that appeared in early February, 1900, right after his death, of course. But they rarely refer further to details of actual events. The impressions of him that first emerged from my New York State sources yeah, he was a laudable, folksy, and homey old gent, people would say, deserving of staunch testimonials to his wise and broad integrity. There were praises of his character and talents, talents that tended to be outright adulatory, but in the suspect way of Victorian tributes, I still couldn't figure out. Who was this guy? It was hard to accept it all at face value. Ah, over hill and dale, he wandered. These reminiscences assured me, however, a familiar face on the dusty New York farm roads of late 19th century New York, uh, uh, rural countryside, a diligent draftsman, a creative copyist and oddly accented stranger regularly invited into the attics and barns and memories of the oldest local families. This is a closed mouthed landscape. I'm a New Englander, kind of a Yankee. I doubt it. Who would let somebody into their house that they'd never met before? Hmm. But he also was a frequent guest on the Mohawk Valley Grange and Opera Hall lecture circuit. Uh, he was represented, it turned out, in museums and exhibitions of national rank. He was equal parts dedicated docent and indefatigable documentarian. He was a teacher of local young scholars and an organizer of aging amateur historians. All this was Rufus Ryder. Oh yes, and as well, in his spare time, did I mention those thousands of detailed drawings? He was an articulate and outspoken correspondent, correspondent of noted historians, antiquarians, collectors, and newspaper editors from Connecticut to Harry from Worcester to Washington, D.C., from Philadelphia to Chicago, and many other elsewhere. Not bad for a nondescript, unmoneyed fellow who'd never set foot in his last hometown until he'd reached 65. So I asked myself, where on earth did a guy like this come from? What kind of personality could be prompted to such feverish local productivity during an aged out-of-towner's final years? What had brought him to that out-of-the-way little burg in the first place? That turned out to be the mystery. And I'm happy to say it's recently been solved. So that's what we'll go ahead and talk about next. Um, I'd like to begin um, with a PowerPoint, a PowerPoint. Um, and I thank my daughter, Ella, and Tom McCullough for helping me get this to work. Um, so I'm ad-libbing this if I 
screw up or stumble, forgive me. That's just the way it is. Okay, slide one. Artist, historian, and advocate of culture in 19th century Kanajahari, New York. That's his signature. He signed every piece of work he ever did. Makes it easy to recognize his work in its many various shapes. Next slide, please. Tom. Yeah, thanks. Okay, he was born in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, which is a closed Moravian village. Closed meaning it was built by the sect and non-Moravians were not allowed to live there. He then moved between Bethlehem, Bethlehem and Emmaus, Pennsylvania, two other Moravian towns between 1843 and 1875. In 1881, he moved to Philadelphia, um, spent a little time back and forth in Trenton, but his final move to Kennedy Harry came in 1883. He died in 1900. Next, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, Lidditz was a small, rural, closed, but very cultured village. Um, it was named after Count Zinzendorf, the, the hero of the Moravians, uh, after a town in Moravia, where the original Moravians settled. They were called Moravians because they had been uh, forced out of Europe. The Moravians were kind of proto-Protestants more than a hundred years before Luther. Um, my cousin Robin would be interested. I think he knows a lot more about this than I do. And I see him there. Hi, Robin. Um, anyway, they had been in Lidditz before they were able to come back to Europe and ultimately to the United States to Philadelphia for its open religion policy. Um, it's located 10 miles north of Lancaster. It's right in the heart of Lancaster County. It's on the cross routes between the West and the South. Um, so lots of people came through there. There were, it was a closed village, but they had a hotel and tavern. So people would come through they were not totally isolated. Next, please. This is a picture. Uh, it's my boyhood home at Lidditz. I'd gone into a local museum in Lidditz looking for information about them. The person I spoke to said, I don't know if we have anything. And while they walked out to check a catalog, I looked on the wall and there was this picture. He had drawn it remembering uh, he'd had a friend um, <coughs> sketch it before it was torn down. And then he drew from that and colored it in years later. Next, please. Um, this is a early painting uh, around 1800 of a synod. And I'm gonna point out just very briefly that you will see one side there are men, one side there are women. Women always had a very strong place culturally and politically in the community. Next, please. Here is an informal synod of 1817. You see the key speaker in this one is a woman. And I will mention that 1817, the year of his birth, was also when um, there was a change in the marriage traditions prior, it had all been by lottery. After that, you could kind of start to begin to pick your own uh, partner. Next, please. Um, I'm putting this in here. This is an old oil painting, anonymous, around 1800. 
of Native American houses in the Linnitz area. As we go forward, you will um, find out Greider was fascinated by Native Americans as were uh, the Moravian community in general. Um, the success rate they had as missionaries and activists within tribal communities is extraordinary. They were non-violent, they were non-coercive, they were fascinated and trying to find out more about American tribal culture ahead of their time. Next, please. This is an image of uh, Pennsylvania Native Americans being baptized in a um, Moravian Sal, a big room. Um, and there, again, there are men and women there. Um, the baptism is performed ritually, uh, but it's, it's very calm setting uh, and they would go home and work with their families. Next, please. Another focus of uh, the Moravians was always education. And below there is a fracture uh, example. This is what I thought I would find Greider was up to, but it's not. And on the left is an image by a famous early Pennsylvania folk artist, uh, Lewis Miller, of what goes on in a classroom. Uh, it's kind of fun. All right, next please. I'm going back to his boyhood home to talk about who his family was. He was the second son in a family of six. His father was a cobbler. His mother had been a teacher. Um, the extended family, uh, they were all as all Moravians were in fact, very musical, very cultured. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Everyone played an instrument. The first performances of Haydn and Bach in the United States were by Moravian orchestras. I mean, it's quite a fascinating uh, uh, religion. Um, but I mentioned here, John Beck, was a neighbor, we'll go into him a little bit more, but he was a school, he became a school teacher after having been apprenticed to Ryder's father. Next, please. In Lidditz, there was a school for girls that began in 1746. This became a boarding school. It's still going, operating today called Linden Hall. But his mother had taught there. His mother was um, teaching art and uh, embroidery and what they call the ornamental branches of education. Next, please. John Beck's school, the man I mentioned before, a neighbor, uh, Greider was a star pupil from the ages of six to 22. He'd left school at 17 to work, but he always worked with Beck at night. Um, Beck's curriculum included music, art, very rigorous academics, and it began to attract boarding students as had uh, the girls' school from Baltimore, Philadelphia, and um, Maryland, uh, other, other towns in Maryland. Please, uh, next. This is a copybook page uh, from his school, of his schoolboy artworks. You've got soldiers, scenes from Shakespeare, sketches of classmates, cop in other um, pages. All of these, by the way, are here at the Moravian Archives and they are all digitized. You would, I recommend go in and look at them. There are hundreds and hundreds of wonderful drawings. Um, there are copies of English lithographs, landscapes, still lifes. They're really fun to look at. Uh, 
when I first, next please, when I first um, came to Bethlehem, in fact, Vernon Nelson, the wonderful archivist that this fellowship is named after, um, I asked how Greider learned to draw and he said, oh, everyone drew then. And then I asked how um, he had, uh, how his work in New York was thought of here. And Vernon said, oh, all his best work was in Pennsylvania. We're not very interested. <laughs> we don't know a lot about it. That's all changed. Anyway, uh, this slide memorabilia he kept for over 50 years has turned up recently in uh, the Lidditz archives where he'd sent it from Kenna to Harry in 1898, same year he wrote out his will. Uh, but these are things that he kept and treasured. This is a funny picture. It's a, a lecture in a tavern. People are asleep, drunk, sleepy, smooching by the fire as a man very kind of elegantly dressed holds forth and reads a lecture to them. Greider had a sense of humor. Next week, please. Uh, this is also from the Lidditz um, archives, things that he sent home. It's a copy of a prize that was awarded to him for his scholarship at Beck School when he was 13. Next, please. Actually, not next, please. Go back. Thanks. I want to just point out, this is the beginning of the type of work that you see of the um, Pennsylvania era. Colorful, beautifully composed, really quite sophisticated. It's nice stuff. Next, please. This is a view of the town of Lidditz that he painted uh, later, 1854. He was on a visit home from Bethlehem. In 1844, he'd moved to Bethlehem, um, began his adult career and very uh, a varied and interesting career, but he was always very fond of Lidditz and he returned often. And this is a sketch he did there. Next, please. In the Lidditz material, he also saved and sent back to the Lidditz archives handbags, my grider mother's handbags of real Nankin cotton. These were 18th century pieces. And you'll note here, grider is spelled G-R-E-I-D-E-R. He dropped the E um, somewhere along the line, but he was always Grider without the E. Next, please. Oh no, where's the picture? Oh, I'm heartbroken. This is the best picture I've got. Ah. Well, it's a hand tinted daguerreotype that shows Grider seated at a little desk at work painting a watercolor. You can see his watercolors. He's painting a still life of a vase of flowers that's sitting on the desk next to him. Where is that picture? Oh, pooey. Anyway, he was 33 in the picture. Um, I have a picture I'll hold up of what he looked like at about that time, but it's much, he's much more handsome in the other picture. But, okay, next. Um, he, in the picture you didn't see, he was uh, drawing these flowers. Um, he had a lifelong interest in uh, botanical illustration and botany itself. Uh, from about 1840, his first public art exhibition, he was included in a larger exhibition, was of botanical works at the Philadelphia Museum in 1852. So he was recognized as, a, as an artist. That's what he liked best. Next, please. 
this is one of the few examples of botanical drawings that survive um, late in New York. Um, he shifted over to uh, other subjects, but they're lovely, they're really lovely. Next, please. I am going to recommend to everyone who wants to know about Rufus Grider, Pennsylvania folk life. You see it here, you see it there, you see it everywhere. Um, John Mormon was a remarkable man. He was a, um, a, a head of the lit its girls school, Linden Hall. He was a researcher, he was a minister, he was very well traveled, but he put together a really marvelous um, article in this issue of Pennsylvania folk life. I commend it to anyone who wants to really understand his Pennsylvania life. The other book there, Ornamental Branches, this has examples of um, his mother's work and includes a story about her having been uh, in love with a man, but the church insisted she marry someone else, Grider's father. And the note alongside this example of her work says, it was for the best. The other one became a drunkard. So you can learn all kinds of things. Next, please. Ah, music always remained an important part of his life. Um, this is a poster from the Bethlehem Philharmonic Society. They were in 1873, they'd already been uh, active for over a hundred years. Uh, the largest orchestra in the United States. Grider was very involved with the Philharmonic. He was a, a treasurer of the society. He was a flautist. His, his first instrument was a flute. Uh, he also played oboe. He sang wonderfully. He was known for all these things. And all through his life, music was a big part of his life. Next, please. Okay. So the work he did in Bethlehem, and again, all of these are available digitally through the archives, um, the Moravian archives here. He filled six albums with detailed ink and watercolor. These scenes of daily life, historical sites, rural landscapes, and everyday objects and things of interest. Charming. Next, please. One um, example, There's this is called Scenes in Memory of a Freshet, June 6th, 1862. The Lehigh River that runs through Bethlehem flooded 20 feet above its banks. Grider climbed up to the top of a church steeple and did on the site drawings. There's 12 pages of this, it's fantastic. Next, please. This is a landscape view of a farm south of Bethlehem. You know, great detail, but also great cultural detail um, evident in the architecture, the outbuildings, the way things were put together. Next, please. This is a wonderful, also in the archives here, it's a view of the Lehigh Valley. Uh, leaning against the tree is a man in a top hat and a blue coat jacket, and there's a little fuzzy dog at his feet. That is Rufus Grider. It's been identified, it's a sure thing. Um, and in fact, there are places in Canada Harry overlooking the Mohawk River 
where he could have seen the same view. And in fact, he did draw himself looking at that view 40 years later. Next, please. One of the things he was also interested in documenting were historic sites. Conrad Weiser was a very uh, fascinating man who, um, he led people back and forth up the Susquehanna all the way to New York State. In New York State, there was a competitor, William Johnson, who was a huge uh, figure in the Mohawk Valley history. He would, lead people down to Pennsylvania, down the Susquehanna. And um, they <clears throat> were both very, very well-versed in Native American uh, tribal customs. They would travel safely through the Indian territories and um, interesting guys. When Grider arrived in New York, he already knew about that area through having studied Wiser's work. Next, please. There's another hand tinted photograph. Uh, this one, he would use this repeatedly in different um, examples of uh, historic scenes about Bethlehem. Next, please. This is a picture of uh, Emmaus, Pennsylvania, he moved to this town for about four years back and forth. There is a remarkable um, segment in his uh, obituary. I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, oh, I've lost him. Ha 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 ha. He, well, anyway, he raised, apples, peaches, grapes, berries, and he would import these things into Kanajahari, uh, Kanajahari, pardon me, to, into Bethlehem from Emmaus. He became a noted uh, experimenter with horticulture. He became the president and the contributing editor to a magazine called Pennsylvania Horticulture. Wonderful articles, very, very well done, very cool. Uh, and he was also noted for wine that he made there. Next, please. Ah, this is a picture that he drew of a boarding school. This is the Bethlehem boarding school, a picnic out under the trees. I don't know if you can see, there are many figures here. Uh, they've all been identified. Almost all of them have been identified as people of the era, but one of them, is the woman he would eventually marry. Next, please. At 45 years old, Grider married Elizabeth Skirving, he called her Lizzie. She was from a, a prosperous, interesting Philadelphia family. She was 20 years his junior. Um, he uh, was enlisted as a recruiter for the Union Army at the time, but he did not go away. He was just training people here. But at that same year, he bought a very famous place here in Bethlehem called the Sun Inn, and he and Lizzie first moved in there. Next, please. Uh, now, a newly discovered memoir of Bethlehem his years in Bethlehem was written for his daughter, Amy. He had two daughters, Amy and Margaret. Uh, this reveals many personal details and it solves a mystery. I'll say this is still in private hands. They are looking to sell it. If anybody's interested, let me know. I can put you in touch with it. It's a fantastic piece. Um, next, please. Uh, the Skirving family home is pictured above. I don't know if you can see it well, but it's a very imposing place. Her father was a noted builder and a designer of heating systems. He designed the heating ducts in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. On January 6th, 
they tried to, some of the uh, Congress people tried to hide in those heating ducts. And I immediately thought of scurving. <laughs> Um, these are also photos of Grider. Uh, the one on top is how he looked at 45 when they married, and the one on the bottom is how he looked when they met 20 years prior. Next. This is a lullaby. This is also in the, in the, in the book. He wrote this for his daughter, Sleep, Baby, Sleep. And I've played it on the piano. It's adorable. It's a lovely thing. It's just, he was a nice man. Next, please. Okay, here's the secret that's revealed in this diary journal. It turns out people said, why did he leave Bethlehem? He was so involved in the community. He was such you know, he was such a figure there. He was so well-respected, so well-known after he um, died. His wife died young and he had two daughters to raise. He spent time with his uh, sister-in-law who had a nanny, who, who hired a nanny for his children they got along very well with her. She was a young Irish woman. Um, they married, they came back to Bethlehem. They moved into this house. She was very, very uh, demanding and unreasonable with his daughters. And he set her up in a house in Philadelphia moved, you know, took a job, moved to Canada Harry, the first job he found. That's the interesting thing. All the speculation is nothing. Anyway, the year he left Pennsylvania, this is the picture of his old house shuttered after, after he moved away. Next, please. And he, this is where he moved. This is the old Canada Harry Academy. He moved to Canada Harry to become an art teacher. He taught in the building to the left, the stone building. The building to the right is where Susan B. Anthony lived. At one point, she was the principal of the women's branch of the Canada Harry Academy. That had moved elsewhere and that house was where Grider lived. And that's right at the bottom of the block where I lived. Next, please. It's a picture of Canada Harry in the um, yeah, early 20th century, but very much what it was like in the late 19, yeah, 1800s. Next, please. He got involved with local history and local life. Um, he illustrated a, a volume, a couple of volumes of um, New York in the revolution, these documentary books. He, I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip through this, but he was a very active guy. In this top um, image next to the church, there's an old building, which will feature prominently in the next slide. Next, please. Yes, thank you. Next, this is that house, When a Ruin. This was the oldest house in Canada, Harry. Grider arrived. It was being used, you know, to store hay and raise chickens. This outbuilding to the right was being dismantled because they were building a house next door. And he said, stop. And he was brand new in town. And he was able to recruit some very leading citizens to restore this house. He said, this is, this is your history. You can't let it go. Next, please. This is a picture. This is called the Van Alstyne Homestead, circa 1749. This is a picture of it when still a ruin. He drew this one in 1887. If you can note, there's a little sled uh, being pulled by a goat all the little 
kids have cute knit hats up ahead as a boy pulling a sled, but the house itself was still deserted. Next, please. This is a view in the center distance of the same house from the other side of the Kanajahari Creek. This is a view that he had from his, uh, his school, his home, and his studio office. Next, please. This is the South Parlor. What happened with the Ben Alstein homestead? They restored it in really quite remarkably. And they, I'm saying they, there were three main um, participants, but Grider was the, you know, the prime mover. They created the first history museum north of New York City in New York, the very first. And it was, this is it. If you look closely, you can see there are little labels on each item. And Grider collected all this stuff going house to house out in the country. Next, please. This is how it looks today. Next, please. These are some of the implements that are still there. Displays of military, agriculture, household, and decorative goods. And there are many of his watercolors and documentary copies that he made. Next, please. Other things, a pet signage. Um, a lot of these things are um, included in an inventory that he made between 1888 and 99, he, they kept bringing in new things. Everything's documented where it came from. Perfect provenance, unbelievable. A real museum. Next, please. And some of these vitally important pieces are in need of care now. Uh, Grider traced many early documents. This is a deed that was signed uh, with tribal members, all those red dots are little um, tribal signatures. There's another uh, document that's currently in dispute. I don't know if uh, Bill Sarna is here, but hello, he's disputing it. Next, please. But what he really got up to in these years was putting together, there are nine scrapbooks of New York all hand drawn, all hand written, everything done beautifully. But you know they're, they're kind of quaint. But when you look inside, they are fantastic. Each one uh, identified separately. Next one. There are nine of these scrapbooks. They're all in the New York State Library. One covers historic matters of Cherry Valley fabulous town south of Canajoharie. Uh, the other is um, Schoharie County. Um, next, please. I'm starting to see uh, signs. Okay. Uh, this is illustrations, um, tracings of documents and pictures of curios, et cetera, et cetera, collected principally in the Mohawk Valley. This is not the catalog of the museum. This is a whole different book. These scrapbooks would be up to 80 pages long, 80 pages, all oversized, quarto, fantastic things. Next. This is a preface to um, one of these uh, fourth volume, but in it he says, um, I've also begun collections of pictures of ancient powder horns, such as were carried by every soldier formerly with, um, um, in, during the French and Indian Wars, during the Revolutionary Wars, carried by officers and privates alike, many handsomely decorated. This became a very large project. Next, please. He did an inquiry concerning the Continental Road. Now, the Clinton-Sullivan campaign during the uh, Revolutionary War was a fascinating 
controversial thing. Now it's considered a bit of genocide. There had been Indian attacks led by um, Tories and French, um, both in New York State and in Pennsylvania, close to Bethlehem. So he was fascinated by this whole procedure. Um, and he documented what they called the Continental Road, which began in Kanajahari. Next, please. Here's a map showing the route taken uh, from New York up near Albany. There's a little red tracing that comes right down to Wyoming and then to Easton uh, in Pennsylvania. One example of many maps that he drew on the right is an example of um, very typical of a, of a page in these scrapbooks showing, it tells a story of who owned this rifle, why he kept it. There's an Indian calumet that he also collected, uh, elements of the works of the gun and a, a, you know, a little landscape showing where the man lived. Remarkable, thousands of these. Next, please. This is a typical scrapbook page from the first volume. This describes a place called Queen Anne's Chapel. It had been um, a chapel uh, commissioned by Queen Anne in the early 1700s for the Palatine um, refugees from um, European persecution. Um, they're interconnected related stories grouped for a cumulative effect. This is very typical of the way he organized the pages of these scrapbooks. Next, please. This is a landscape with a whole story. It also shows the Erie Canal as well as the river, another whole story of um, what had happened in that area. It shows in fact, the Fonda farm ancestor of Jane and Peter Fonda. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, all these things are quite beautiful, but at this point he's not going for picturesque effect. He's really going for documentary landscape. Next, please. Now we go to an example of correspondences that he would initiate for projects throughout his life, he organized dozens of major and minor undertakings, often by subscribing contributors who would you know, raise money, commissioning great art, see an example here, um, from doing something that major to um, digging up buried boulders. That's what this is about. Next, please. The letter, um, a series of letters instructing workmen how to excavate this vast granite mortar that had been um, a relic of a tribal site that was now in a stream bed. It became an engraved memorial to the Battle of Stone Arabia, Stone Arabia being a famous town next door that figured prominently in the revolution. Next, please. This is the power of the gospel, Zeisberger preaching to Native Americans in the wilderness. Grider had heard all of these stories as a boy. And in the 1860s, he proposed working with Bethlehem elders and uh, businessmen, uh, and then his in-laws in Philadelphia, who knew this wealthy publishing family, they commissioned the artist Sisler, who also had taught in Bethlehem for a while, to do this painting. It's enormous. It's here in the archives. I wish I could show it to you. It's the size of the night watch. It's a whole wall. Fantastic thing. And it was Grider's idea. Next. If you can see this at all, this is a check from the Kanajahari National Bank, but on the check, there is printed 
the Van Alstyne Homestead, the museum that he started, the officers of this bank were Bartlett Arkell, A.G. Richmond, S.L. Fry, and Grider, the founding member, members, but they were also members of the school board and Grider was involved in designing what that new academy would be. Next, please. This is the West Hill School. This replaced where he had been before. And I'll also say this is why my family moved to Canada Harry. I saw that school, it was still being used for kindergarten and first grade. And I said, we bought the house up the block. I said, our daughter can walk to school there. She'll always love education and yay verily, it worked out. But this is where he worked. He designed all the interior um, art studios and uh, music studios. It's a remarkable structure. Next. Um, another thing just to tell you, he also was a fanatic fisherman. He walked up and down streams, lakes, rivers, explored the woods as well as the rural landscape. Next, please. This is a look, uh, look down a lake um, from a place in the Adirondacks, went there to go fishing, liked it, told the story. Next, please. Okay, we talked about powder horns before. In one of the um, scrapbooks, there are examples of um, some powder horns he'd collected. These were around every family who had been in the area for a good while had one. Um, am I really out of time, Tom? Oh my God. I've talked way too much. All right, powder horns, next. Next. He would figure out a way to unfurl them. These map, these horns had maps engraved on them. So people who got lost, you could tell what was the next town up the river you were following. Next, please. This catalog of powder horn pictures has 500 plus powder horn drawings. It's with the New York Historical Society now. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Again, within these, there are all Native American elements carved on the, the uh, powder horns and in his scrapbooks. Next, please. Because the next thing he started was a study of Native American subjects. Um, there are 300 drawings of medicine, sacred medicine masks, of the Iroquois, they were collected in uh, three years um, to be a part of the, to establish a collection at the um, new New York State Museum. He documented every one of these and there's provenance and all the stories. There was a fire in the museum in 1911, all of the originals were lost, almost all of them. And these are now, no one has ever really seen these. I mean, except they're in the Newberry Library in Chicago. They're astonishing. Next, please. These are more examples of them. Each face has a different effect and uh, a different symbolism. Next, please. And these are other booklets about Grider. So far, there's not a lot published, but we're trying to fix that. The end. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, one thing we cannot do through Zoom is giving you a warm applause. This was a 
fantastic uh, presentation on a very talented man. And um, it was really fascinating. So many beautiful images and he was so productive. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, I um, was looking at the chat if there were any, any questions. We don't have much time, but we can take a few questions. Um, if anyone has a question that you would like to ask our speaker, please put it in the in the um, chat. Um, I have a question. Alice, did you mention what profession Grider had when he came to Bethlehem? Why did he come to Bethlehem? What, did he work here? The general store. Okay. Which is why he was so familiar with the, you know, objects of everyday life and why he was fascinated with you know, drawing them, using them. Yeah. <laughs> he ran businesses. Right. Yeah. And he made this interesting image of the house where he lived with his second wife, and that was yeah. when the shutters were closed on the yeah. on the drawing. But do you have any idea what the address was, where he lived? I do, mm -hmm. but I don't have it off the top of my head. I'll give it to you. We'll talk about <laughs> that later. Thank you. I have three addresses for him in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Good. I see that Judith Williams is asking, how many marriages did Grider have? Uh, two. Two. And did he take his daughters with him or did he leave them with his second wife? He brought his daughters to Kanajahari with him. Mm -hmm. One became a missionary in Alaska. The other... Mm -hmm. Oh, that's 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 interesting. We uh, were also fascinating to hear why he left Bethlehem, and you mentioned that, but maybe you can repeat that. Um, what the reason was why he left? Yes. Well, that's partly why I came here to follow up on this. Uh, divorce was not even a concept among the Moravian community, um, or an accepted one until 1957, evidently, 1957. So in the 1880s, it was not accepted. His wife was very unhappy here. She would rant and rave and rage and wanted to move to Philadelphia. And then he built her a house there and left her there. I don't believe they ever divorced, okay. but that's why he grabbed a job that would take him far away. Yes. And with his um, it's a sad story. Um, do you know how much the family is asking for the book that he created for his daughter? Uh, yes. Yeah. $10,000. Mm -hmm. There was a similar book that came up on Antiques Roadshow about 10 years ago. This is one of their all time greatest finds. Somebody bought it for 25 cents. It was sold for $30,000. So as I say, his work is now considered. And there are many, many, many illustrations in this book. Yes. Yeah, I remember that, uh, that story on the, the Antiques Roadshow. It was quite fascinating. Yeah, um, can that you was a picture of his daughter, Amy, by the way, that they showed there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Can you tell us where his work can be seen? Oh, my God. At the Van Alstein House in Canada, Harry. Um, there are other museums in upstate New York that have holdings. The Schoharie Old Fort Museum, um, the Fort William, Fort... Johnson, uh, William Johnson's house in Amsterdam, New York, um, the Fort Plain Museum, um, but they're scattered and there are not very many of them. You really have to go seek it out, Yes, which is too bad. I mean, that's why I was, I have to thank, by the way, Diane Forsberg, who allowed me to curate a major show of his work. It was the first one that had been done. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alice, for this wonderful presentation. We're really out of time right now, and uh, but I'm sure that there were many people who who really enjoyed seeing all this beautiful artwork and hearing uh, what uh, you had to say about it. Thank you again, Alice. Thank you again.
thank you all for uh, for watching this uh, presentation today. Uh, we were very glad that we had you all here. Thank you so much.